All right, take your Bibles and turn with me to Joshua chapter 15, if you would please stand. I handed the paper to them. I, I tried to write down the title and, and the, uh, the reference where we're going to be preaching from to, the, to them back there. I've been starting to do that instead of just telling them. And uh, they called me back and uh, Doug wanted to know. He said, uh, this is this Joshua 15 through 19. Uh, I said, yeah, it's all, it's all chapters. We're going chapter 15 through chapter 19. Tell him I hope he brought his house slippers with him. We're going to be here for a while. Anyway, I'm going to read some verses. I'll, pour, I'll, I'll call out what they are, and you can flip to them. We're in these chapters here. And uh, in Joshua chapter 15, verse 63, last verse in that chapter, it says, As for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. Chapter 16, verse 10. And they drave not out the Canaanites that dwelt in Gezer, but the Canaanites dwell among the Ephraimites unto this day and serve under tribute. Joshua chapter 17. Verse 12, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass, when the children of Israel were waxen strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. Joshua chapter 18. The whole congregation of children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up a tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not yet received their inheritance. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are you slack to go possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers have given you? We've been going through the book of Joshua, looking at some of the different things and that the Lord has for us there and a different... Tonight we want to look at something else, something that is really kind of the theme from chapter 15 all the way through chapter 19. A title that I've given it is, Do Not Fall Short and Quit. Do Not Fall Short and Quit. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening and asking that you'd meet with us. Now, Lord, there's so many times that things get hard, they get difficult, they get monotonous or maybe weary and we quit. Help us not to fall short, but help us to press on for you and to do that which you have called us to do, to live for you, to serve you, to magnify you, Lord, to, to abound in the work of the Lord. Have your will and way, Lord, in service tonight. Lord, we do pray for these. We pray for Leah and, and others, Lord, the, uh, this neighbor, friend of, um, of Martha's and different ones, Lord, is going through health issues. Brother Ronnie uh, Gibson, Lord, and just touch his body and be with him, be with Brother Ronnie Baker, Lord, and others. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your mercies and goodness to us. But Lord, for every one of us, it would be advisable for us to consider the lesson that's here tonight in the book of Joshua. Have your will and way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. The easiest thing in the world to do, listen to me, is to quit. The easiest thing in the world to do is quit. It takes no effort to quit. It doesn't cost a dime to quit. Quitting is easy. The sad part is, is that many Christians quit. They begin to throw up their hands. They begin to get weighted down and before long they fall out and they quit. There's a man by the name of Pat Williams. Some may know who I'm talking about. He is the co-founder of the Orlando Magic. It's an NBA team. When he was uh, 13 years old, he learned a lesson that he never forgot. He was a good baseball player. You say, well, that sounds strange. Uh, if he was a co-founder of the Orlando Magic, that's a basketball team. Yeah, but he, was, he loved baseball and he played baseball, and even at, at, a, at a minor league level professionally for a little bit before he switched over and did some stuff with, with basketball. 
But when he was 13 years old, he was a very good baseball player. And he went out for a team that had boys on it that were significantly older than him. Lo and behold, he was chosen to be on the team, even though he was quite a bit younger than the rest of them. As they was going to the first game, he was riding in the car with his mom and with his grandmother. They were taking him to his first baseball game with these older boys, and he knew, man, he, inside he felt the, he was worried about it because here he is, he's a lot younger than these other guys, and he's about to play the, against the, a lot bigger guys, and, and he was worried about it, and, and he was fretting, you know, how that all goes. And he finally was quiet, and his grandmother and them said, what's the matter? He said, I just don't know if I can do this. He said, I, he said I, I, I'm playing way out of, out of my league. And he said, I just don't know if I can do this. And, and he got quiet. And finally he said, well, I guess if it don't work out, I can always quit. His grandmother wheeled around, stuck her finger in his face, and shook her finger in his face and said, young man, nobody quits in this family. He took it to lesson, and he never quit. Even though it got hard and, and playing against these bigger boys and these older boys, he, he hung in there and he did well. Well enough that he made a, a minor league professional team and, and then he changed his profession and stuff. While he was in that realm and working in the offices and stuff, uh, different ones for, I, I believe it was for, for the, the baseball league and, and the M, MLB and stuff, he was approached about trying to start a basketball team in Florida. There was no NBA basketball team in Florida. At 46 years of age, he took it on to start an NBA basketball team in Orlando, Florida. He worked 18-hour days every day at trying to put together a team trying to put together everything that they needed. I cannot imagine what it would be to try to put things together to, to start an NBA basketball team from scratch with nothing. After a lot of adversity, a lot of problems and everything, we now have the Orlando Magic basketball team. He goes on and says that the reason that he was able to do it and work those long hours was because of that little grandmother sticking her finger in his face and shaking and said, we never quit in this family. He said, you know, he said, I've run up against a lot of problems, a lot of difficulties, a lot of struggles. He said, the whole time, he said, it never even once entered my mind to quit. Sitting in this auditorium, listening on on Facebook and YouTube and watching. There's people who are sitting there that you've got in your mind possibly about quitting. Quitting different things. I'm not talking about bad things. I'm talking about maybe quitting being involved in, in, in ministry. Maybe quitting uh, witnessing to a loved one that has rejected you talking to them for, for a long time. Or maybe quit talking to somebody trying to get them into church because they have said no and no and no and no. And they seem to not want anything to do with it. And it seems as though that you're not getting anywhere and you're ready to quit on it. Or maybe a, a child or a grandchild or someone that you've tried to reach and, and it seems like no, no. It seems like you're running up against a lot of, uh, of brick walls or maybe people have uh, in, in those situations where you've tried to get them to Christ and they, they have got mad at you and they begin to push back and they begin to fight back at you. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's, maybe it's a neighbor. Maybe it's a, uh, somebody in the family. I don't know, but you're ready to quit on, on trying to reach them. It's easy to quit. It won't cost you anything to quit. But you'll regret it throughout all eternity. I remember, and, and I've told the story before, but I've got to tell it because, for this segment of it. My uncle was a good man, very good man. Went to church some, 
and we, for years we had tried to witness to him, tried to give him gospel, give him gospel tracts, and, and just got absolutely nowhere. And I'm going to be a harm and honest with you, there was a point at which I was ready to quit witnessing to him and trying to reach him. And then he started having some heart issues and doing things like that, and we went back again. And he got saved at 89 years of age. Baptized when he was 91. What if I had quit? Nobody else that I know of was witnessing to him. What if I had quit? What if somebody had quit on you? What if somebody looked at your life and said, hey, and quit? Where would you be? You see, perseverance is hard. Quitting is easy. If everyone does only what comes easy, nothing of significance will ever get accomplished. You know, it's a lot. It, 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 and and the, the thought has run through my mind at different times. And I thought, boy, it'd just be good to just kind of coast on through. Go do a lot more fishing. But that would mean quitting. There's so much more that needs to be done in our day and time, especially in these last days. Nothing of significance will ever will get accomplished if we quit. You see, they'll quit when it gets hard or face adversity many times. Israel would never have been delivered from bondage if Moses had quit when it got hard. Israel would have never possessed the promised land if Joshua quit when it got hard. We would still be lost in our sins if Jesus had quit when things got hard. The Christian church would not exist today if the apostles had quit when things got hard, when there was adversity. Here in Joshua chapter 15 through 19, you find the children of Israel falling short, though. They're settling for less than God's best, and they're on the verge of quitting, even after all that God had did to bring them through. They'd seen, or they, they knew and seen, they, of course, the, the older ones had, had died before they come in because they had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. But yet you have those who were kids and were young and they'd seen how the Lord had brought them out of Egypt, had seen the plagues and stuff in Egypt and how God delivered them out of Egypt, brought them across the Red Sea on dry land, land closed up the, the Red Sea on Pharaoh's army, brought them through the wilderness and, and then uh, led them across the Jordan on dry land again and had defeated the enemies coming in, seen the walls of Jericho come tumbling down. They had experienced all this. They seen how that God had provided food for them for 40 years. They seen how that their shoes never wore out. They seen how that their clothes never wore out. They seen how that God brought water out of a rock. And how that every time that God had, had led them and they had done what God told them to, every, every enemy was defeated. And yet they were about ready to quit. Israel was setting up a record of failure and quitting. We read there in 15 verse 63, it, said, it was talking about Judah, how that they failed to drive the Jebusites out, through the, though the Lord had commanded them to drive out the inhabitants of the land. They had to go in and drive them out. We find there it says, and as, the Jebusites, as for the Jebusites, the inhabitants of Jerusalem... The children of Judah could not drive them out, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Judah at Jerusalem unto this day. So, well, preacher, you just read it there. It says that they could not drive them out. Do you mean to tell me that the God that said go in and drive them out was not still with them to drive them out? But they begin to slack off. They begin to quit. Why? Because it got hard again. It was difficult. They stopped short of it. They quit. In chapter 16 and 17, you find the two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, failed to drive out the Canaanites there. 
Verse 12 and 13 of Joshua 17 says, The children of Manasseh could not drive out, again, could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxing strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. So, well, preacher, right there it is again. It says they could not drive them out. No, they couldn't, but God could. Yeah. Right. Sometimes the reason that we're ready to quit is because we're doing it all in our own strength. We fail to realize that it's God that has got to fight the battles. It's God that's got to drive out the Jebusites. It's God that's got to drive out the Canaanites. But we've got to be willing to go and be used of him to do those things. Many times we take a lot upon ourselves without allowing God to take a hold of the matter. And then we get discouraged and we are about ready to quit. God didn't tell the Israelites to make slaves of the Canaanites. Did he? Did he? He said drive them out. And yet you find here, you find uh, the, the, that Judah, they put, uh, they put the Jebusites, they put them under, under uh, bondage or, or basically made them slaves and, and so forth, hewers of wood and things. And you find that Manasseh and Ephraim, they do the same thing there. It says, uh, yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxing strong that they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not utterly drive them out. They put them to tribute. They had to work for them when things were going well. They, could, they had them as slaves, but they couldn't drive them out. There's always a price to pay when you disobey God's commands. You go on down through the Old Testament, and you'll find that these Canaanites and these Jebusites were a thorn in their flesh, and there was a curse to them. And many times what took place is it helped lead them away from God, and then God had to put them into bondage. Why? Because they quit. Because they failed to follow through. Because they come up short in these areas. You and I, God wants to use us. There's a, there's a great work for God to use in your life and my life. He said, well, well, well preacher, I, you know, I can't do what I usually do. No, but you can do something else that God has for you. You can, you can stand for the Lord. You can pray. You can, you can witness. You can tell others about Christ still. It's easy to quit. What if you, and most everybody in here, has drove an old stick shift? What if when you got to that hill, you started up that hill and you didn't change gears? <laughs> what's going to happen? Some of you have done it. You know what's going to happen. <laughs> As you mature in life, sometimes you've got to reach down and shift gears. Guess what? You're still going up the hill. <laughs> if you didn't shift gears before long, you're going to be quitting. Yeah. You're not going to be climbing anymore. And so sometimes in our lives, you have to shift gears, but not quit. You keep going. You keep going. You keep going back when it gets difficult and when the struggles are, are, are happening in your life, when you're trying to, to, to get somebody to come to church and they keep putting you off and keep putting you off and keep putting you off. After a while you get discouraged, you think, and just forget it and, and you're ready to quit. No, don't. Just If you have to, reach down and shift gears and, and keep on going. Don't quit. Don't quit. What if God quit on you? What if God quit on you? Well, I've tried, to, I've tried to get them to come and get saved. I've tried to get them to, to live for me. I've tried it. And they just won't. And, and what if he quit? But he's never quit. Joshua then calls them together in chapter 18 here for a meeting and a rebuke. Look at verse 1, chapter 18. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up a tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. 
And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes which had not received their inheritance. Why? Because they quit. It got hard. They hadn't went in. They hadn't continued. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, look at the next verse. And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, How long are ye slack to go to possess the land? Why aren't you getting in there, man? Have you, have you ever had somebody kind of get out? Why haven't you got that done yet? Why haven't you accomplished that? Why haven't you got in there and got that done yet? I've had my dad do that to me before. Why don't you have that done yet? Well, you know, lawnmower don't want to run right. That weed eater's dull. I'm not talking about one of those with a string on. I'm talking about one that you swing. We didn't have one of those with a string and a motor on it. The only string we had was you swung like that, and it, it was a strain instead of a string. Amen. The fact is, is that they had were slack. He said, why, why are you, uh, how long are you slack to go possess the land? He's rebuking them here, which the Lord God your fathers hath given you. He said, wait a minute. He said, God's given this to you. Why haven't you taken it? Do you realize what God's done for you this, this evening? You ever stop and think about that? Do you realize that God wants to use you? That's why he's got you where he's got you in life. If God wasn't wanting to use you, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Where would I be, preacher? Well, if you're saved, you'd be in heaven. Because you're not going to be gone until he's ready for you to be gone, and you're not going to be gone until he's done with you. Even if you're not accomplishing what he wants you to accomplish, he's trying to get you to accomplish those things. Hey, why, why are you slack? Hey, get in there and serve God. Well, preacher, I've heard of it. You know, one of these days I'm going to really get down to business. Really? One of these days I'm going to, I'm going to really surrender my life to the Lord and I'm going to start praying a lot more. Really? One of these days I'm going to start daily devotions in my life. Really? One of these days, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this or I'm going to do that. One of these days, preacher, I'm going to go talk to this person over here that I, I've, been, I've been praying for him. I've been praying for him, preacher. I've been praying for him. But one of these days, I'm going to go talk to him. Really? Why haven't you already? Why are you slack? Can you guarantee me they'll be alive tomorrow? There's an urgency in reaching this lost world for Christ. And too many times we become slack. And the Lord wants us to move on and to do, possess the land that he has for us to possess. They had, Joshua was saying that what's taking you so long, what are you waiting for? The Lord's given you this land and as an inheritance, why haven't you claimed it? Let me ask you something tonight. Has God promised you the power of God on your life? Do this, because He has. <laughs> he has. Have you claimed it? God has promised you so much, but why, why haven't we claimed it? Oh, how we need to realize that it's not time to quit, it's not time to be slack. It's time to push on. We're living in the last days, and there's not a whole lot of time left, and, and so we need to give it everything that we got. We need to put everything into serving the Lord and, and following Him. You see, they repeatedly quit before the job was finished. They had settled for second best. Well, preacher, you know, we got, we, we, we got the land over here. We went in. Joshua, we went in, and we've got it in everything. And Well, who's, who's those per people over there living by you? Well, that's the Jebusites. What are they doing there? Well, we couldn't get rid of them, but we got the land. Do you have all of it? Well, we've got the land, you know, basically. They're, they're living on it too. After all, Joshua, have you ever talked to any of those Jebusites? They're not so bad. They're not, they're not too bad. I mean, they're just like you and me. Yeah, they believe differently. Yeah, they do this and they do that, but you know, I think we can get along. 
They'll do what they want to do and we'll do what we're supposed to do. But what you're supposed to do is possess the land and drive out the inhabitants. And what's happened today with Christians, God told us to go in and, and to be that witness and be that testimony to, to reach this world for Jesus Christ. And we're just settling for second best. Can I ask you tonight, in your Christian life, where you're at right now, are you happy where you're at? Have you settled for second best? Or ha have you quit? When you're supposed to be going on in and, and doing what the Lord has told you to do, you see, they had settled for second best to let them live among them. It became a curse unto them many years later. Did you ever stop and think about the day in which we live and all the people that claim to be Christians and what's being accomplished for the Lord? There's some polls, the surveys that have been made the past few years and that claim that there's 40, listen to me, 40 million evangelicals in the United States. 40 million. Now, let me say this, understand, when their interpretation of a Christian and evangelical is pretty wide, pretty broad. <coughs> but what if we took 20 million of those who claim to be evangelicals? In the Latin, that word, we get that word evangelical from the Latin word evangelium, which means good news. It means that we're to be a spreader of the good news. What's the good news? Salvation through Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say we, there's 40 million of the evangelicals that claim to be evangelicals. Let's just take 20 million of them. What if 20 million evangelicals went to work tomorrow and began to share Christ with the people around them? 20 million. Not 40. But let's just say half of them. Go to their office. They begin to share what Jesus Christ has done in their hearts and lives. They begin to share the gospel with them. Some of the kids go to school. They take their Bible with them. They begin to share with their friends what Jesus Christ has done in their heart and life. They're witnessing at school. They go to the grocery store and they begin to talk to the cashier and they begin to talk to people around the vegetables over there and, and you know, however they would get into the conversation, begin to share Jesus Christ with them. Give them a, reach in their pocket, pull out a gospel track, give them a gospel track. 20 million of them. And we do this every day. There would be waves of people getting saved. Lots of people getting saved. Well, let's just take it down to where we live, okay? Without being mean, can I ask you, when's the last time you shared Jesus Christ with somebody? We're to be bearers of good news. He says, go out in the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full. He said that we're to take the gospel to every creature. But somewhere along the line, we've quit. Somewhere along the line, we've backed up. Somewhere along the line, we have begun to coexist with the lost world without sharing Jesus Christ with them. We've become, could I put it this way? We've become comfortable with not spreading the gospel. We've quit. We've backed off. You say, well, preacher, I mean, you know, we're living in a world where that there's a lot of animosity towards so-called evangelicals or Christians if you begin to try to tell them, man, they'll, they'll cuss you out. They'll do that if you pull out in front of them, too. That's the world's way. That's what a lost person does. That's proof that they need Jesus Christ as their Savior. 
the fact is, is that day in and day out, many people go to work and they never share their, their faith with anybody else. They never tell them about what Jesus Christ has done in their hearts and lives. We've quit. We've backed up. There was a time when you was excited maybe about, about living for the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe right after you got saved, boy, you was excited and, and you sharing the gospel with others, trying to reach others for Christ, trying to get people in church, trying to, trying to get the gospel out, trying to reach souls for Christ. And over adversities maybe, and maybe somebody spoke ill to you. You backed off. Maybe you become a little ashamed to stand up for Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark chapter 8, 38, he says, Whosoever there shall be ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. You say, well, preach this. You've been kind of mean to us. Here, we're, on, we're here on Wednesday night. I understand it. It's like preaching to the choir. Amen? <laughs> but I'm just being 100% honest with you. I'm preaching more to me than I am to you. Is that fair enough? Because I feel like I need to be more of a, uh, uh, instead of, uh, 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 I need to step out more and be more of a witness and get more of the gospel out and try to reach more people. Because the time is short, the day is short, and we need to be taking every opportunity that we can to reach people for Christ. But I feel like churches in, as a whole have, have quit. They've traded much of what you see traded off. They've traded off preaching and, and the gospel and everything for, for, a, for stage bands and, 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 and uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, highfalutin, uh, high-energy worship services where the music is ramped up and, and it's like a, a rock concert instead of a worship service. And we've traded that and... You know why we, the world has traded for that? Because they can invite the lost world to that, and they'll come to that because they feel comfortable there. Yeah. Well, preacher, isn't that what they're supposed to feel? No. I'm going to be honest with you. Before I got saved, God did in my heart, I sure wasn't comfortable. <laughs> when I realized I was lost, when I realized I was going to hell, I wasn't comfortable. The fact is, is I'm not saying that we've got to try to make them miserable, but what I am saying is this, is that, hey, listen, there's a major difference there. And we should stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. We should take that and serve him. You see, then you find something else that took place here. Joshua sought to stir the head, their hearts, and uh, afresh for, for the Lord and for the work. Look again in Joshua 18, verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh, and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. The tabernacle was where they met. That was Israel's house of worship. That's where they come together to worship the Lord, a place of worship. And Joshua knew that worship was essential to the life of that nation. Can I tell you t tonight that worship's essential to you and I? We need that. We need that. And many times what takes place is it place in our, in our services or maybe in our devotions or our prayer times is that we fail to really worship the Lord. And, and we just kind of go through the routines. We just kind of read our scripture. We kind of pray. And we never really get down to business of worshiping the Lord and lifting him up in our hearts and lives. When we do that, we're missing something. I think a lot, to be honest with you, a lot of times what has happened is we've quit on true worship. Magnifying the Lord from the heart. But here's something that Joshua knew. Joshua knew that there need to be some worship and we need to worship God also in order to renew our sense of awe and our obedience and our motivation to serve him. Basically, if you go back and you look at this, what Joshua is doing here, he is reminding them of who brought them out of Egypt, who brought them into the promised land. 
and they're to worship him and they're magnifying him. And when you begin to talk about, can you imagine standing there and, 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 and thinking about, boy, look how he dried up the, the Jordan River. Look how he dried up the Red Sea. Look how he defeated our enemies. Look how he provided food for us in the wilderness. And look how he, he kept our clothes uh, from, from uh, uh, deteriorating. And look how our shoes lasted all these 40 years. And, and even as we grew, the, everything grew with us. And we didn't have to replace any of that. And, and look what he's done and how he's delivered us from the enemy. And, and boy, I'll tell you what, that gets you excited about how good he is and how great he is. And it begins to move on your heart and it makes you want to worship him and lift him up and praise his holy name and glorify him and magnify him and exalt him. It stirs your heart. When you think about how great God is. So Joshua knew, hey, listen, they, got to, they, got, they need to remember. So he brought them into worship. Brought them to the tabernacle. So when Joshua brought them there and they began to speak uh, uh, about, the, uh, uh, about these different things, he reminded them. Reminded them that God had promised them that unclaimed inheritance. And he began to call them to worship. Can I tell you something? That worship, whether it's here in this building or whether it's in your bedroom at the foot of your bed or wherever it is when you're praying and talking with God and you're worshiping God, there's some things that should happen. True worship should challenge us. True worship should convict our hearts. True worship should inspire us to live for God, to serve God. It ought to stir our hearts to magnify Him. It ought to empower us. When we think, hey, wait a minute, it's not just me, it's God that's going to do this. Not only that, but it should motivate us. A lot of people, I've, I've talked to people who are going through uh, different issues in, in life and everything, they sit down and, and one of the things I've heard them say is, I'm just not motivated. I'm just not motivated. It's like... Janine, I talked one, one day and I told her, I said, or Hunter's talked to me before about, hey, you, may, you do these exercises and everything, you can lose that gut. <laughs> I said, you know, you're right, but I'm not motivated. I'm not motivated to get out there and run. I used to run five miles a day. I'm not motivated to do that no more, folks. Now give me my fishing rod and let me go to the river. I'll, I'm motivated to do that. <laughs> what about our motivation to serve God that comes from worship and realizing who he is and what he's done and what he's going to do what he can do that's motivating us and so he brought them into worship and to, and so that they would be motivated not to quit but to press on and to claim the land it, it'll motivate you it'll revitalize you have you been just wore out and seemed like you don't have any strength anymore? Hey, listen, some good old worship and, and thinking on the Lord and getting in the Word of God and praying and, and getting close to God will revitalize your life. Then it'll instruct you and it'll equip you to go out into your mission field and claim it for the Lord. He said, I want to help you get there. And he said that he would. Luke 14, 23 says, And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be full, filled. Hey, listen, the Lord said, I want you to go out. He's trying to motivate us. He's trying to equip us. He's trying to use us. But sadly, many just want to spend their entire lives in church. They think that their mission as a Christian is to occupy a certain pew in a certain building every Sunday morning. Can I tell you something? Your mission is not to sit in that pew. That's not God's mission. Now, he wants you to come to get fueled, to get motivated, to go on. But that's not the mission that God's given each of us. He's told us to forsake not to assemble ourselves together. That's just part of getting here and getting prepared. But there's a mission field for us. You see... The mission field is the office, it's the grocery store, it's the school, it's our neighborhood, it's the factory, it's the gas station, it's wherever we go, that's the mission field. That is the mission field right there. The mission field doesn't stop at the church door going out. That's where it starts. When you open that door and you leave tonight, you're stepping into the mission field. 
That's the mission field out there. When you step out of this building, step on that street, hey, listen, that is the mission field. And the Lord says, don't quit, don't, don't fall back, don't stop, keep, keep on going and be motivated to go and claim the inheritance that God has for you. Don't become satisfied to just dwell among the lost world and never tell them about Jesus Christ. They say, well, preacher, what if they don't get saved? That's not your responsibility. Your responsibility and my responsibility is to tell them about Jesus Christ and give them the opportunity to get saved. But we've got to go. We've got to invite. We've got to, you say, well, preacher, I, I, I don't have all the verses down. I, I don't, I, I'm not going to do that. Tell them what Jesus Christ has done in your heart and life. Tell them the difference that he's made in your life. Share with them about the time that you got saved. Every Christian should have a testimony. And that testimony is what God did in your heart and life. Share that with them. Our mission field starts out there. And oh, how we're to take it from these four walls and we're to go unto the world. Not just part of it, but all of it. The crucial lesson of Joshua 15 through 19 is don't quit. As we see the day getting worse and worse and waxing worse and worse is what the Bible says will happen in the last days. It's not time to quit. It's time to get motivated. It's time to get busy. It's time to get stirred. It's time to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. The darker it gets, the brighter the light will shine. And oh, how we need to be that shining light. Never stop doing the work God has given you to do. Never stop reaching the unsaved with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Never stop witnessing and spreading the good news. There's somebody this week that God wants you to talk to. There's somebody this week that God wants you to invite. There's somebody this week that God wants you to be a blessing to. There's somebody this week that God wants you to pray with. There's somebody this week that God wants you to give them a gospel track. There's somebody. Don't quit. Preacher, I just know how they're going to accept it. Doesn't matter. Just don't quit. Keep pressing on for the Lord Jesus Christ. In a day and time when it's easy to quit, don't quit. As I said in the beginning, the easiest thing to do is quit. We can't quit. Jesus Christ is coming back. We've got to be busy. We get our strength when we worship and draw nigh to God. Maybe not, you just need to find a place. Say, Lord, I'm tired. I felt like quitting. I don't want to quit. Help me to press on. Revitalize me. Give me new energy. Motivate me. Stir my heart afresh and anew. And seek the Lord to guide you and direct you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We love you. Many times because of the adversity and the difficulties and the struggles in life, we're ready to quit. Ready to throw up the, our hands and say, I'm done. But Lord, we can't do that. We've got to keep pressing forward. Just as the children of Israel were to keep on going in and they're supposed to drive out the inhabitants and they're supposed to possess the land. Lord, the biggest thing they failed to realize is that the power to do it was available through you. And probably they tried to do most of it in their own strength. And they got tired and they got weary. Help us to realize, Lord, that you're here to help us, to strengthen us, to carry us through when we're too tired to go, to encourage us, to, Lord, to give us direction, and to give us the ability to do what you want done for your honor and glory. Have your will way, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.